I appreciate your faithfulness in coming out on these Wednesday nights. It makes it worthwhile to search the scriptures and pray and seek the Lord's face to be able to provide you something that uh, enthuses me and it edifies me. So I know by that that it will edify all of God's saints. So I appreciate your attendance on these Wednesday nights. Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse number 7. Luke 22 and verse number 7. We're trying to follow the Lord in His earthly ministry each step of the way. And we have come now to this particular event. Luke 22 and verse number 7. <clears throat> the title of our lesson uh, is the last five words of verse number seven. The Passover must be killed. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, behold, when you have entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, The cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Exodus chapter 12, not assuming that everybody knows exactly what the Passover is all about. Separate the word and you'll find out what it was. It was God passing over the houses of the Israelites in the land of Egypt when he killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians. Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Verse 6. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Verse uh, number 12. <clears throat> For I, I shall pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will, two words. Passover. It's the Passover. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And if you know of the spiritual meaning of that, we are still doing, doing so. 
1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Get ready to weed, okay? Get ready to read. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. Would you finish it out for me? For we in Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Why does this ancient tradition of Israel have anything to do with us? Who did you learn in that verse is our Passover? Christ. Christ. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. His blood is put over our hearts. We are dwelling in the house, our body. If this earthly house be dissolved, the apostle said, I have a building in heaven. So we have the blood applied to our souls. And when judgment and wrath falls upon others, God sees the blood and he pass over us because Christ is our righteousness. All right, Luke chapter 22. The Passover must be killed. Verses 8 and 9. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that ye may eat, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? Now, it doesn't seem like to me that Jesus procrastinates, but because he was had a lot of planning going into this, as we will find out later, but it seems like that he waits till the last minute to inform the disciples as to what they're going to do about the Passover. He kept this secret and, and its plans to the very last. He evidently had made preparations. He had evidently had things going that they didn't know about. Uh, but uh, he only told uh, two of his disciples uh, right at the last moment. He didn't tell them all. In Matthew chapter 26 is a similar passage. Verse number 17, it says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? So it's right on up to the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we read in uh, Exodus that you've got to get all the leaven out of your house. Some rabbis recommended that they go through their house at least three times looking for all leaven to get it out. Because leaven rises on its own. Yeast, whatever you want to call it. But... Uh, God said, we are a new lump. Did you get that? We are a new lump. We are, we are not leavened by the things of life or works or, or ego or efforts. Our righteousness that causes us to rise is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are not to add anything to the work of Christ. What would that be, by the way? It'd be like putting an old, you know, putting a, a, an old patch on a new garment. It, how, how can you add anything to what Christ has done? Well, he, after he had finished his work, he sat down uh, and there forever. Now, why did the Lord not tell the disciples where they were going to meet? Luke 22, verse 3 and 4. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priest and captains how he might betray him. They were glad, covenanted to give him money, and he promised and sought opportunity to, to betray him unto them, listen, in the absence of the multitude. Now, would you please be so kind as in Luke chapter 22, would you uh, read me the last three words in verse number 11? With my disciples. Who was going to be in the upper room with Jesus? Your three words, please. With my, disciples. my disciples. So wouldn't that fit the bill that this would be a place where there would be an Absence of the multitude. Yep. 
So he didn't tell Judas. He's not going to have this interrupted. He is not going to have Judas use this place to betray him. Yes, there will be a place. God has had it designed. It is laid out. It will be where God wants it to be. Jesus Christ sovereignly in control of everything. No man hath power to take my life. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. And I'm not telling anybody what we're going to do about the Passover because Judas would, would know that this would be a place and they say that this upper room, if it was typical of all those upper rooms in Jerusalem, had side stairs on the side of the building and a side entrance where you could come and go without disturbing the house. Be a good place for them to arrest Christ. So he didn't tell them. Dear soul, the Lord Jesus Christ has made sure that that table sitting there saying this do in remembrance of me was established by God sovereignly so that 2,000 and some odd years later you could still be partaking of that ordinance. This is an ordinance that the devil cannot stop. This is an ordinance that he would have stopped if he could have, but Jesus Christ made sure that two of his trusted apostles, John, fervent in affection, and Peter, fervent in activity, going down the road together. Where are they going? They don't even know. They're just looking for somebody doing something that they don't usually do. Men carrying water. Women usually do that. So that's what they're looking for. So we find it's just kind of like that uh, passage where he said, y'all go over there to the next city and find an ass tied with, his, with a colt and uh, you unloose the, the colt and bring him to me. And if anybody asks you, uh, what, uh, what are you doing? You say, the master have need of him. They'll say, okay. So they didn't know where the ass was, what street it was on, or who owned it, anything about it. They just know Jesus told them, go do it. They went looking for it, found it, started undoing the ass. They said, what are you doing? They said, the master have need of it. They said, okay. And that's the ass that he rode into Jerusalem and fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah. Dear soul, we're going to find out one of these days that God's got everything in hand. Yeah. Everything's all right, honey. Amen. Right. Amen. I don't care how you feel about it. Everything's all right. And if Judas is around somewhere to give, give the devil opportunity... He ain't going to let him know anything. Just going to tell Peter and John. Luke chapter, excuse me, John chapter 18. John chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron. Where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples? Would you read me down to the snake eyes of verse 2? And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. See? And listen to the rest of the verse. For, the reason he knew the place, for Jesus oft times resort, resorted thither with his disciples. And now look at the next verse. Judas, next word. Then. then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priest, comes and they come and arrest him. So, uh, John 18, 1 through 3 is the best commentary for Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, 8 and 9. If you put that down, it may help you remember why did Jesus tell only two of his disciples at this late date, where they were going to have the, uh, uh, the Passover, but yet not give them an address and not tell them the man's name who owned the house. It was because he knew the works of the devil. It was his will that Judas betray him. It must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto him by whom the offense cometh. But it's not going to be till I say it's going to be. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross as some wimpy little, uh, you know, crybaby. He was sovereign Lord on that cross, 
And it was exactly like he wanted it to be or it would not have been. Amen, Brother Gene. Now, Luke 22, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. And here's some unusual words. Before I suffer. I don't remember God, the Lord using that word suffer all that much. But before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Not only was there a caution against evil keeping Judas from knowing what they were going to do and what he was going to do to prevent his early arrest in a wrongful time and place, but there was also a positive yearning for this to be done, and he wanted it to be kept just right. Do you fellas remember when you took out your best girl? You ought to smile when I'm talking about this because she's watching you. And you want everything to go right? Because you had really had a great desire to have a night together. Maybe that was the night you gave her that ring. But you wanted it to be done right. What is heaven about? It's about a man and a woman. I show you a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So we see that he has a great desire to be with his bride. He doesn't want any interruptions. He deals with the negative side of it and leaves Judas out. Yes, Judas is going to be there. It says with the 12 apostles in verse 14, but he didn't know where it was ahead of time. Look at 2 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse number 9. There is something here that is more glorious than what we know. For the Lord to say, with desire have I desired, and we'll get to those words in a minute. It means that there's some urgency of love and some urgency of a desire for communion. Not just communication, but communion between him and his bride. There's something special here. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, that is the, the sacrificing of the Lambs there in Jerusalem, the animal, the lamb, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious, that is the law and its sacrifices, had no glory but only in this respect, by reason of what? The glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. So the Lord said, with desire have I desired to eat this with you. I'm not going to eat it again until the new, new with you in the kingdom of God. This will be the very last time this can ever be legally done in the sight of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, if you will, verses 9 and 10, we find that this, uh, this communion that they had that night ended the last time, as Jesus well said, I'm not going to do this again until the new kingdom. Uh, it ended the old economy, and listen to Hebrews 10 and 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, he taketh away the first. Do you know what the first is? The first covenant. Mm -hmm. That he may what the second? Establish. Establish. It's never going to be done away with. 
Jesus Christ is going to fulfill the law and fulfill the prophets. Therefore, that first covenant that they had that uh, dealt with works will be overcome by this glory that excelleth with a covenant of grace and mercy. And it will be established forever by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Last three words, please. All right. Did he die? Yes. Was it accepted by God? Yes. How do you know that? Because he rose from the dead. Right, amen. So when he died, it was once. once for all. That's it. There was a termination in this ordinance under the old economy, never to be done again. The Passover now is Christ, as you well read. Now, Mark chapter 4 and verse 19. Let me show you the phrase, with desire have I desired. A lot of words, right? Well, don't blink because the one that I'm fixing to show you and i let, uh, let the cat out of the bag by saying one. <clears throat> Here is the exact same Greek word in Mark 4, 19. You better be ready. The book of Mark, chapter 4, and verse 19. Here is the same Greek word. When I stop, read me one word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the... Lust. That's it. L-U-S-T-S. -S, lusts. So what do we read in Luke 22 and verse 15? And he said unto them, With lust have I desired. It was such a passion that it was pushing and urging him and the only word you could get that would describe it and we always think of this as some evil thing but he was talking about a, a yearning so great that it was like a lust carrying a human being away into sin of course it wasn't with him uh, let me show you where this word comes from Acts chapter 20 and verse 33. Acts chapter 20 and verse 33. You ready to read the word from which our word with desire I have desired comes from? You got your place? All right, I don't get to read anything. You read me the first three words. It's like coveting, yearning, wanting something he hadn't got, lusting for it, urging the humanity of God by the Holy Spirit to want to do this. Why? He wants them to be the apostles upon which the foundation uh, of, of the New Testament church is built, the gates are, are of the new city of, of the church are, are named for them. They are the 12 foundations. It is to be established forever. He wants it to be put into gear. He wants it to be put into practice. He wants the old to pass away and behold all things to become new. He wants the old covenant to be fulfilled so that he can establish the new with desire. Almost like a lust, with a yearning, a burning, a, a, a love interest with you. Like a man with his wife. I have desired to eat this with you. I want to finish this thing out. While we're in this part of the Bible, Revelation 3 and verse 20. How can Jesus say that he will not partake of this till the kingdom of Christ comes. I guess some people think 
because they think the kingdom is eternal glory and won't come till eternity comes. They think he hadn't had anything to eat or drink with the church since then. But listen to Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the church door, that is, and knock. If any individual inside of the church hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will you finish it out? And he will stop with him and leave with me. Isn't that good? The Lord said, I'll manifest myself to you individually. You come to me, I will not cast you out. And we'll partake of the glories of God together. Isn't that great? Go back to Luke 22, if you will. <clears throat> Luke 22 and verse 28. Luke twenty two twenty eight. 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the spiritual kingdom the church and God's people eating his flesh and drinking his blood needing him having a hunger for him blessed are they that hunger you're going to be filled God is going to su sustain you and supply your every need through Jesus Christ and the root word for the word soul is the word appetite <clears throat> I saw a little newborn baby and the daddy had him in his arms and the little knucklehead baby was trying to suck on his earlobe. You can't get near a baby's mouth with anything without, without him trying. That's an appetite. And dear soul, if you have an appetite for God, God said you're blessed. Blessed hunger. You have a, 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 a living soul spoken into existence and brought into existence for the glory of God and you are an appetite and he is the bread of heaven he's the bread of life he, 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 is, he is everything you stand in need of Jesus Christ is your supply of your every hunger ain't God good God is so good now <clears throat> we Go on down in this, and in Luke 22, in verse number 10, it said, And he said unto them, Just go to this address in this street, just punch it in your, you know, your Tom Tom or your whatever, your garment, and it, you can find it. No. <clears throat> he told Ananias, Go down a street called Straight, and there you'll find it. No, he didn't give him the street. What did he tell him? He said, Behold, when you enter into the city, going to Jerusalem, ye shall meet, listen, there shall a man meet you. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Lord. You, you understand that this is a Passover week. There's going to be crowds like, and, and, the swelling of the population of Jerusalem is going to be unbelievable. And you're telling me that we're going to meet a man. Yes. It says, there shall a man meet you. Listen. Bearing a pitcher of water. <clears throat> Whom did Christ choose? To be the last host of Jesus and the first host of the church. Who would you choose? It's the last time you're going to be entertained. I'm not ever going to eat this like this again, ever. 
I'm going to eat it new in the kingdom. Who would you choose? He's going to be the last host of Jesus on earth. But this is where the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is going to begin. He's going to be the first host of the spiritual church on earth. Well, he's got to reflect his master. Let him that would be great among you be your servant. servant. You're going to find a man. Well, it's not that there's just one man in Jerusalem, but there's only going to be one man bearing a pitcher of water. You know why? That's woman's work. Keep your bricks, ladies. In according to the scriptures, John chapter 4, the woman went to the well to get the water. Who was this man? I don't know. What was his situation? I don't know. But I can tell you something about his character. He wasn't too proud to bring water back to his house. Maybe his wife was sick. Maybe she had gone to see about her sick cousin or friend. And he was there by himself. Most men would sit there and starve to death till his wife got back. This man knew how to take care of things. And when it called for it, it didn't matter. He went and got the water at the well and was bringing it back. And it says, I want you to follow him. There shall a man meet you. Sounds like he was coming in one direction, he was going in another, had to turn around and follow him. Bearing a pitcher of water, listen, follow him. Here are the two great apostles following a householder, a servant, a man that's not ashamed to do what was considered in those days a woman's work. I want you preachers to follow this man who is domesticated in the kingdom of God in so much that I choose him to be my last host on earth and the church's first host because that's what I'm like. And supper being ended, he removed his garment and began to wash their feet. I need a man that will be the host that has the provision for us. It's a large upper room and it's got furniture in it. We don't have to do anything but just go in and as far as the room is concerned, everything is ready. What kind of man do you want? I want a man that is, that is sophisticated enough in humility. Guess that's good to say that that he feels comfortable and confident that he can carry a pitcher of water through the streets of Jerusalem when there's more people there than there ever will be any other time. And he said, I want you preachers to follow him. And I wonder what Peter and John thought as they walked through there. And I don't know if any water sloshed out on his shoulder, you know, or what, how it happened. But I wonder what they learned following that man. With that, picture, with that picture of water. And he said, follow him into the house. The domesticated, humbled servant of Jesus Christ will take you to the place that Judas can't know about. This is the way I'm going to devise this. You will be absolutely certain where we're going to meet, but Judas will not have any awareness of where it is because he's not going to follow any man carrying his wife's pocketbook. But Peter and John did. And that's how God made it plain to them. I wonder with all of our religious aloofness and our human pride, how many times 
We've missed the house where Jesus would come to commune with us when we made fun of a man carrying a pitcher of water. Mm. God have mercy. The thing about it is, in verse 11, And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith, listen, unto thee, personal message from Jesus Christ to the good man of the house. All right. Did you notice the invitation when we read the scriptures? The master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with whom? Was this man one of his disciples? Well, read on down in verse 14. Forget the word disciples. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve, twelve apostles. All right, was this man one of the apostles? He wasn't invited. Mary wasn't invited. She's in the other upper room in Acts chapter 1. They turn and go back into Jerusalem and they go into an upper room and it lists out all the people that were there and Mary and the other women that were there with her, but she's not invited. This is Christ establishing the foundation of his church and its ordinance. This man is not just great because he carried a pitcher of water. This man is not just great because he had a room that Jesus could use. This man is great in that he could provide for Jesus that which he would get no benefit from himself. Well, I ain't going to do it. I don't get nothing out of it. You don't get anything out of Christ having his will and having his way and establishing that which will lead you on into eternal glory. Well, it ain't going to do me no good. How do you know that? You either love the Lord or you don't. Right. Well, he didn't invite me. The man is great because he provided everything but wasn't invited himself. My soul, what kind of man is this? Well, you know, who are you going to see when you get to heaven? I'm going to see David. I want to see Samson. I want to see Solomon. I want to see Peter. I want to see, I want to see this guy right here. But I don't know if I'll be able to because he'll probably be a whole lot closer to the throne than this poor preacher, preacher will ever be. I may not ever get eye, get eye contact with him. This is more like Jesus than I've ever been. God have mercy on my pitiful soul. Mm. You know, most men usually, when they do anything, uh, they want everybody to know about it. Men like roosters like to jump up on the fence and crow. A woman can wash the dishes, mop the floor, and clean the house 15 million times. Man, do it one time. Look what I did, honey. Hello. Come on now. Right? right? Yeah. But not this fellow. He's not going to have any part of it. It's not going to benefit him any. He ain't going to be honored. We're not going to slip him in the side door and say, we dedicate this meal in behalf of the water toter. Nothing. Isn't that amazing? But he stands in the face of God as being the last earthly host for Jesus Christ. And he stands in the face of God as being the first host for the church. Isn't that amazing? And we don't even know his name. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Now, those words in verse 14, and the 12 apostles with him. Would you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11? First Corinthians chapter 11.
we use this passage from time to time when we have what we call the Lord's Supper. And uh, here we have uh, the Apostle Peter, excuse me, Apostle Paul telling us how that this thing was trans, can I say transmitted to him? The awareness of the Lord's Supper did not come by hearsay to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse number 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I have received three words. Of the Lord. Of the Lord. Now who is I? Well, it's the Apostle Paul. Well, what was his title? What, you know, what was he? A pastor? Teacher? Missionary? What was he? An apostle, right? So Jesus met in verse 14 of Luke 22 with his 12 apostles. This thing is handled by God with those apostles and established forever as a covenant with us throughout all eternity. And the apostle Paul said, I want you to understand now what I'm telling you about the Lord's Supper. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. How did, quote, unquote, you get it? We got it from an apostle. How did the apostle get it? He got it directly from God. Say amen. amen. Ain't God good? Mm. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he gave thanks and on and on you know the rest of it. So we see, dear soul, that if you look to Ephesians chapter 2, that this foundation of the apostles is established for us and, and folks like me, nameless water toters, we, we need to bow under the absolute authority of Jesus Christ and his apostles. If the apostles said it, preach it. If the apostles said it, believe it. If the apostles didn't say it, stay out of it. We have no authority to believe or to teach anything outside of that which Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, gave to the 12 foundations of the apostles. Amen. Amen. I am a pastor. My boss is every apostle. The CEO is Jesus Christ. I cannot say that I'm walking with Jesus Christ if I am not adhering to that which the apostles gave me. Why? That which I received of the Lord, the apostle Paul said, I delivered unto you. That's how we got it. In Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Revelation 21 and verse 14. Revelation 21 and verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. You want to finish the rest of it? I hear pages flipping our weight. Why don't you just read the whole thing to me when you get there? Revelation 21, 14. Start when you want to. In the wall of the city and the twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The apostles are the foundations upon which our faith is built because theirs was received directly from God. I don't and no other man has had direct revelation from God since God said don't add to this book and don't take anything away from it. I don't care what apostle what's his name said on 
20, 50,000 watts WGUN Apostle Smith or what? He ain't no apostle. This is why Jesus had this thing set like this. Now, did you notice in verse number 11, Luke 22, verse number 11, what the Lord said he wanted to see? Luke twenty two eleven, And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the blank? guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover. Would you like to see that exact same word? You said, well, not really, but I guess we're going to, yeah. You ain't going to get out of here without doing it. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. We don't know what that means, but it's strips of cloth wrapped around him. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the... Yeah. That word in is the exact word guest chamber. Alpha and Omega. In the beginning of his life, his earthly life, his human life, there was no guest chamber for him. The world is all too willing to provide a guest chamber for the death of Christ and all those who are the lights of the church and the salt of the earth. They're all too willing to provide a guest chamber at the end of his life or his death, but not so willing to provide a guest chamber for him in the beginning of his life to come among us and to show us our sin. The Lord had not where to lay his head, Matthew eight twenty. He had no place for his life, but he was provided guest chamber for his death. He had no place, but he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for y'all. I don't want your hearts to be troubled. You have believed, believed in God of the Old Testament. And here I am on the scene saying, if you have seen me, you've seen God. So I want you to know that your hearts need not be troubled, that that belief and faith in God in the old economy can be put on me transferred entirely, completely to me because I and the Father are one. one. Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believed in that God, then believe in me. And I want you to know, in my Father's house are many apartments. I'm not going to leave you out. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to be without a place so that I might provide you a place. I go to prepare a place. Do you believe it? Don't say us. Say for me. I go to prepare a place for me. I personally prepare a place for you personally. If it wasn't true, I would have told you I wasn't going to do it. But I want you to know that when I go and prepare a place for... Oh, that's so weak. <laughs> Help me out, friend. I'm trying to do this by myself up here. I go to prepare a place me. for me. And if I go, did he go? Yes. Yeah. I will come again. And you want to know where the place is? And receive you unto myself. Where is your place? It's wherever your lover, your heavenly husband, your bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ is. He will not have place to lay his head. There is no room in the guest chamber. But you will never be without a shoulder 
which supports the entire government of the world to lay your head on. I want everybody that's ever called on God and he said no, turned you down, I don't want to hear you, I ain't going to do anything you want. I want you to raise your hand. If God has ever failed you, I want you to raise your hand. Let me get mine down. He will, he will smite a man's wife so that he has to go walking through Jerusalem, not in an off day when there ain't many people around, but when everybody can see him that have come in out of all the, all the cities in Jerusalem, excuse me, in, in Israel, to Jerusalem for the Passover and make him walk down the street with a water pot in order that he might have a host to prepare a place to meet with his beloved. And then he'll turn around and not even bite that man. Jesus Christ was left out of the benefit that you have at the cross. He, he knew no sin. I know God hath highly exalted him, but he had to enter into that which he had no part of in order to bring you to that, you and I to that, which we never would have been brought to because of our sin. And dear soul, you walk with God. I don't care what it looks like, how bad it looks, how bad it feels. The just shall not live by feeling, it shall live by faith. And you honor God by faith and know that Jesus Christ is going to take care of you, going to see after you. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? Mm. Now, there's one other thought that's in my mind. I want to get it off. I want to give you everything I got. It'll be like David going to the army. I'm going to give you all the bread and cheese I got. I want you to look at Luke 22 and verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and who was with him? Okay. That includes Judas. Now, we've already been to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go there again. This is the Apostle Paul teaching us about the Lord's Supper. All right, why was Judas there to partake of this last Passover feast? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink, drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many are dead. You say, my Bible says sleep. I know. It's talking about they're dead now. They're gone. If Listen, if you're going to make it with God, you're going to make it at the provision of Jesus Christ, the Passover, the Lord's Supper. If you're not going to make it with God, you're in the broad way, but you're in the church, and you don't discern the Lord's body, and you are unworthy because you're unregenerate, and you partake, then God said you're going to be like Judas. You're going to eat and drink damnation to yourself. This thing's a double-edged sword. The Apostle Paul said, That which I received of the Lord, I gave unto you. The eleven apostles got it so that they could pass it on to the church. This one apostate didn't get it in order that he might eat and drink damnation to himself. Last passage, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 15.
Acts 1.15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. And he lists them there. And I told you there were women there in verses 13 and 14, but Mary not invited to this one, this upper room. Men and brethren, this is Peter talking. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Does that sound like 1 Corinthians 11 to you? Eating and drinking damnation, there it is, folks, literally happened. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Verse 25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostle, an apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. The loneliest place you will ever be, and I hope and pray to God nobody in this, uh, in this room goes there, is hell. There won't be any company. There won't be any communication. There won't be any communion. There is no device or work in hell whither thou goest. And Judas now, he didn't want the place Christ went to the cross to prepare for him. So he had to go to his own place. I don't want my own place. I want to be with Jesus. How about you? God is good, isn't he?